What is going on people? It has been a very, very long time since I've done a video and I thought it was time to do one because, well, it's been a while. So this video in particular is probably just going to be all over the place, just randomness, just random thoughts of things uh, that I think need to be talked about for mostly, I would say, to get beginners on the right track. Uh, we're going to talk about structuring of perfumes, quality of materials, and things like that. Um, so yeah, it's like uh, I didn't really have much of a, a theme or notes jotted down. I just knew I was like, man, it's been like a good couple months. I, it's time to come out with another perfumery video. Excuse the mess. I'm, I'm still. I'm currently working on a, uh, a fragrance because uh, I'm going to Cabo in March, which is a couple months out, and I was like, I, I want to make myself a nice Cabo fragrance, something I could wear to the beach, something aquatic and beachy and nice. So I got to get something nailed down real soon so I can let the, the blend macerate and get it ready by March, which is like three months away. So many trials to go still. But anyways, uh, let's see, what should we talk about today? So I had a few notes. Um, the one thing I did want to talk about that struck me uh, not early on in my perfumery journey, but over probably over the years, I, I've noticed the quality of materials makes a huge difference. Now, when I, when I mention quality of materials, I'm mostly speaking towards naturals. Like if you're buying uh, aroma chemicals, you know, like Hedion is Hedion wherever you get it. Well, hopefully it is if it's a trusted supplier or, you know, uh, any sort of aroma ke uh, chemical, you know, aldehydes or a, a mugwe material or something like, uh, you know, uh, melanol or you know, ozone materials, like anything that's a chemically created substance for perfumery, technically is gonna be the same across the board, as far as quality is concerned, uh, wherever you buy it, because there's not gonna be any variance. Like if you purchase Izoe Super from, you know, Ventos, or not Ventos, uh, yeah, actually Ventos, I mean, if you purchase a Ventos, Vigon, you know, Perfumer's Apprentice, Perfumer's Supply House, for the most part, you're getting the same material. It's going to be the same unless it's expired or near expiring. Then you might notice some off odors. But when you purchase Izoe Super, you're going to get Izoe Super regardless of where you buy it from. It's always going to be the same. But when it comes to natural materials, the variance is so big depending on where you get it. And it's not so much... Uh, where you get it as far as a retailer because you still want to buy it from a trusted retailer but it really depends on where the retailer is sourcing it from because you can get natural materials from all over the world from different sources all over the world like uh you know if you were to get uh just lemon you know essential oil you can get it from you know italy or you know, Peru or, or, or any other country, like even here in the U.S., that, you know, they, they make lemon essential oil. And they vary so greatly. But not only does where the material is sourced or manufactured at important, it's really, does that source, do they have a good, clean way of actually creating the natural oil whether if it's steam distillation or you know cold pressed or if it's co2 extracts or, or whatever i've noticed that different sources have different grades of of natural oils and to give you an example i was ex uh, experimenting with uh what was it green mandarin oil and I've now acquired probably four different green mandarin oils, and they're all sourced from different places, whether if it's sourced from a different, you know, the same or different retailers, every retailer gets it from 
you know, their distributor, their distributor gets it from wherever the it's distilled from. They're all different sources and they all have a different nuance. Some are good, some are bad. Uh, in the case of like the green mandarin oil, I'm not going to mention where I got it from, but like one that I've purchased from a very reputable retailer, uh, their green mandarin oil is very pithy. And when I mean pithy, I mean it's just like at first smelling it on the paper strip, like the first, you know, 15 to 20 minutes is great. It's very vibrant and mandarin like and sharp and zesty. And then it turns very pithy, earthy and just dark. It's it's not pleasant. But then I've purchased other oils where it starts off the same, very zesty, very tangy, very mandarin-like and, and zesty. And then it doesn't really turn into this weird earthy pithiness. It just kind of stays linear all the way through. And I'm like, okay, that's good. And I've noticed now that when I purchase natural oils, um, I generally always buy it in small amounts first to test it, just to see what it's like, put it on paper strips to compare it with my other natural oils. And if I like it, I'll buy more quantity, usually much bigger quantities. But I always start small now. I never just jump right in and buy large quantities of a natural that I've never smelled before. I've learned the hard way, trust me, because I've bought many things that I've got quantities of that I'm never gonna use, quite honestly. I, I just won't use it. I might use it as like a room spray or something like that around the house, but I'd never use it for perfumery. Um, so the quality of naturals is very important. Uh, trusting your supplier is important as far as whether you're getting what they say you're getting. So if, if you're buying like say neroli oil, you know, do your research, make sure they have an SDS sheet, uh, a certificate of authenticity sheets and things like that. Because if they don't, be wary um, and email them first and, and ask for it. If they don't have it, I would never buy it from that place. I would never, ever buy it because that just means that retailer doesn't even know what they're getting from the supplier. So that's an untrusting source, in my opinion. So I would say... Over the years, the there's a couple places that I pretty much go to that I trust for naturals. And I'll go through a couple right now. And I'll, I'll rank them kind of like, you know, some are good, some are great, and some are just like, hell no. <laughs> um, so one, I would say the best, probably the best source that I've ever had for naturals is probably John Steele, which is uh, also known as Life Tree Aromatics. Now, when I say the best, I mean their materials, their natural materials are so clean. Like, I remember purchasing just recently, I purchased a couple, uh, you know, citrus oils. I forget which ones. Maybe it was lemon or something like that. Usually when you purchase lemon oil, you see a tint of yellow or some are very colored yellow. John Steele's was clear white. And I was like, wait a minute, did they send me water? What is this? And then I open it, put a you know paper strip and I smelled it. It was vibrant, juicy, clean and strong. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. I've never had a natural citrus oil this clear looking before, uh, but still smell like it was the best thing I've ever smelled in my life. So. Uh, John Steele Life Tree Aromatics, I love going to them for naturals, but they are super expensive. They're probably the most expensive I've came across as far as naturals, but they're very well worth it. But again, start small and make sure that you like the product first, because there are a couple items that they do sell that I came across that were still good. But then I smelled it and compared it to some of my other uh, materials that were sourced from other retailers, other places. And I was like, well, I wouldn't really classify this as any much better than this retailers. And it's, you know, a fraction of the price over here. So test before you buy, but I highly, highly rate John Steele uh, Life Tree Aromatics as far as naturals. Um, another place that uh, I really, really like going to now is Eden Botanicals, uh, also in the US right here. Eden Botanicals, I would rank as my second favorite, mostly because 
They're very clean uh, as far as their naturals, and they're priced reasonably well. They're not as expensive as John Steele. I would say they're a tier below as far as pricing, but their quality is pretty on par depending on what the material is. Uh, so those two are my probably go-tos for naturals. Um, now the next one I would say is, now this threw me for a, a wild loop because Perfumer Supply House, which I shop on them on like a, probably a bi-weekly basis. Uh, they have a great selection of both naturals and aroma chemicals. I always get my aroma chemicals there first if she has it. Uh, but then once in a while, I'll purchase some naturals from her. And I was kind of surprised and blown away because she'll source it from uh, trusted suppliers like um, Bonto, which is a, uh, a natural supplier. And Bonto makes great stuff. Um, who else? Uh, Albert Veal, which is another uh, natural supplier overseas, and she sources from them great materials. So Perfumer Supply House, another trusted supplier from naturals for me. Now, there's one tier that is kind of hit or miss uh, when it comes to naturals, and I would say that's Liberty Naturals. Uh, I believe it's libertynaturals.com. And they're local here in the U.S. too. But this one, while I do trust them, you will get COA, authentici uh, authenticities, uh, SDS sheets, all that stuff. But some of their oils are kind of hit or miss. Some are pretty good and some are just kind of like, eh, not so great, but acceptable. They're acceptable oils. But I will say this they are very very well priced i mean they are probably budget priced so in in a sense you do get what you pay for i guess but to put it in perspective um i'm a very huge fanatic when it comes to lavenders i've got six different lavenders and they're all kind of sourced from different places my favorite lavenders i found were from eden botanicals um i have yet want to try one lavender from Perfumer Supply House, which she gets from, I think it's from Bulgaria or some, some place that's not France. Usually I get mine from France and I want to try that next. I haven't tried it, but Eden Bot Botanicals has great lavenders. And then when I got to Liberty Naturals, while they were acceptable, they were on a completely different level of lavender for me, whereas I think of a lavender as very soothing, very high in like linalol, linalol acetates, and you smell a lot of just airiness and aromatics, and it's just very, you know when you smell a good lavender, you'll know it. And then I get to Liberty Naturals, and I was like, well, it's a good lavender but it's very dark it's very kumarin rich so it's a different side of lavender where it's still aromatic but as it dries down it's no longer clean it's very earthy kumarin heavy uh darker side of lavenders and they offer like four or five different lavenders and i've tried a few and they all kind of just felt the same they start off great and then they dry out to kind of something kumarin dark earthy Whereas all the other lavenders where I've gotten from like Eden Botanicals, they start off great and they dry out great. But that's not to say that you shouldn't get it because maybe that's your thing. Maybe that's your vibe. Maybe you want something that starts off bright and aromatic and then dries out more warm and Kumaran like. So again, try before you buy. Sample as many different oils from different retailers and different sources before you make a, a concrete decision on, okay, this is what I want to buy in mass quantities going forward. Um, and that's not to say that that could always change down the road too, because what I buy today from, let's say, John Steele may be different three years down the road. If I buy the same oil from them, it doesn't mean that, you know, that same oil three years later is going to smell the same because every year's crop when they harvest and distill or extract may be different based on like natural things like soil conditions and, and things like that. So dealing with naturals is always tricky. 
Uh, but when you find something that you do like, <laughs> like when I find something I like, I get a mass quantity of it and I store it in a refrigerator and preserve it as long as I can. So that's enough about natural. So the, the key takeaway from that is your quality of naturals uh, will vary from source to source, but it's very important because I've done many trial batches with perfumes where, for example, like if I'm doing this one, you know, if this was lavender, you know, I'll do a trial batch with lavender, you know, melettes from France. And then I'll make another same batch with the same amount of proportions with a different lavender, maybe something like of a high elevation lavender, see what the nuance brings out. And then I'll try another one, maybe like a budget lavender, you know, something that's Kumar and rich and see what that batch smells like. That way you can pinpoint the differences of what a different lavender would do in the same blend at the same dosing proportion. So it's always good to have different lavenders or a good, diff you know, good, good amount of different naturals of the same substance, I guess, is another good takeaway point. So, like I said, I've got uh, like lemon essential oil. I've got many different ones from different retailers and different sources. They all smell a little different. Some I gravitate more to more freely because it's I can trust and I know it. Uh, some of them, if it's a cheaper fragrance that I'm working on and budget's really you know, a concern, I might use a cheaper oil that's not so great, but it could be as effective. Anyways, quality of naturals. That's that's all I'm gonna say about that. Now, I am gonna take a sip, dry my throat a little bit here. Another thing that I wanted to uh, bring up or talk about, and I think this comes up in my comments, like, in the uh, YouTube videos. I mean, yes, I don't have really a lot of time anymore to comment back or reply to, but I'm still reading them. I'm still, you know, checking things out and seeing what people are saying. And I think this question came up a lot and it's geared mo mostly towards beginners, but um, people are always asking like, you know, how do you start a perfume? Like, is there a specific step that you need to do? No, there's no specific way or step. Like to give you an example, when you start a perfume, always have a plan in your head. Like if you don't have a plan in your head of what you're trying to achieve, you're never going to achieve it. Um, so usually in my case, if I'm starting a perfume, a perfect example is the one I'm working on right now is I know I'm going to Cabo and I want it to be like a very beachy, summery, tropical, uplifting, you know, vibe for myself. So that's kind of like my own personal brief and that's my own goal that I have to achieve. And I'm not going to sit there and keep tweaking my, you know, formula with different materials that might steer it off the path that it wasn't intended for, if that makes sense. Stay on the path that you're trying to achieve. You'll get there quicker if you have a path to stay on. If you don't have a plan or a path, you're never gonna go anywhere. You're never gonna get to the end. Um, so when people ask, well, where do I start? Obviously, you, you start with a plan. You have to know what the end goal is, what your brief is, you know, what the style of perfume, what maybe some of the, the featured notes you had in, in your mind. But another thing, uh, that kind of trips people up is they they ask well do you you know do you just prepare a whole entire you know 60 line formula and then just start you know doing it based on that or do you smart start small in the chunks and go off that and quite honestly there is no right answer to that because you can do either way and still end up at the end of your goal long as you know what the end goal is so the longer you're in your perfumery journey, whether if you're a beginner, novice, expert, the more you learn your materials, you kind of have a sense in your head how things are going to play out even before you start preparing and dosing. So a good example for that is like I know the one fragrance that I'm working on right now is going to be what I consider pretty mainstream, pretty generic, pretty 
designer, I guess you could say. And when you look at the whole scope of designer fragrances now, it's there's a very common, what I call like a backbone. There's a very common theme for the skeleton of what you should use. And when I say skeleton, I mean a backbone or a skeleton of a fragrance is a few common materials that are used in mass quantities, like a bulk, uh, uh, high percentages. And then you can start to add in nuances of smaller dosing, smaller percentages of other things to kind of shape and mold it into how you want. And to give you an example, most designer mainstream fragrances usually have a structure of high doses of like Izoe Super, Hedione, some sort of white clean musk, whether if it's galaxolide, ethylene brassylate, habanolide, something clean, something very lightly scented. And there's usually a good dose of some sort of like citrus oil. So from top to bottom, you could already see the structure. Like if you were to start a formula in your head and say, well, I'm going to make something and I'm going to start with, I'm going to, if we're looking at percentage of a a hundred percent as a total, I'm going to start with uh, 10% of citruses. They could be any citrus of your choice, lemon, bergamot, whatever. Just say 10% of citruses, 10% of Izoe Super, 10% of Hedione, and 10% of some sort of white musk, whether it be galaxolide, habanolide, whatever. So that's 10, 20, 30, that's 40%. So now you have 60% still remaining of your formula to shape this into something that you want. So you have a backbone structure kind of already built just based on four materials. Um, but you could even go higher. Let's say if you were like, well, let's start with 10% citruses, 20% Hedione, 20% Izoe Super, and 10% Galaxolide. So now you got 20, 20, 40, 10, 50, 10 for citrus, that's 60%. So now you're at 60% of the formula just based on four materials. Now you only have to worry about 40% of the remaining formula is just nuances of other things. So in that, in that case, you would just be like, okay, well, I've got, let's say 10% citrus, you know, we'll just say it's gonna be 10% lemon oil. 20% Izoe Super, well, that's easy. 20% Hedione, that's easy. 10% of white musks, let's say you want to be like, okay, well, I'm going to do, of that 10%, we'll just take it and be like 5% Galaxolide, 5% Habanolide. Now you have to say to yourself, well, I've got a backbone. I've got like a nice bed of this materials that all my little nuances are going to sit in and just kind of play and swim in. So you have to think of your end goal. Be like, well, what's my end goal? What, what, look, what fragrance am I trying to achieve for who, for what, for where, for when kind of thing? And then you start putting in little nuances. Like if you're working on something that's going to be very aromatic, you can be like, well, I'm going to add some lavender. How much lavender? This is where you have to start to play around with it. You can start off and be like, well, let's add 5% of lavender in the formula. Okay, that takes care of now we're at 65% of the total formula. So we got to keep going be like, what else do I want in this perfume? Well, I want to give it some sweetness. Okay, let's try vanillin. Let's try a dose of 2% vanillin. Maybe that could be too much. We'll start at 1% and see how it goes. Okay, so now we got some sweetness. So now we want to add in some, let's say we want to add some woodiness to it. Well, there's so many different kinds of woods. We'll, we'll keep it simple. Uh, we'll do patchouli. Uh, so you can be like, well, I don't want it too woody. I just want an essence of patchouli. So let's just start with 2% and see how it goes from there. And then you just keep adding in materials based on your overall theme of what you kind of envisioned you wanted this smell like. But if you wanted obviously the smell to be very patchouli forward, you'd put more than 2%. But again, this is knowing your materials and when you do perfumes and you've blended so many different styles and variations, you kind of know the do's and don'ts of certain classes of fragrance, whether if it's a freshy or if it's an aromatic, if it's a gourmand kind of thing. You kind of know the do's and don'ts of like where you should stay within ballpark 
percentages of certain materials. But as you keep going, you can be like, ooh, I want to add in some uh, something that's kind of like, you know, woody ambery. When you get to the woody amberies, now you've got choices of like, you know, things like ambercore from uh, suppliers called cow. You can like throw in a whopping like 5% of ambercore or you can uh, and then just add like traces of a super amber like um, ambrosinite or something like that. But you can kind of see where I'm going with this, where the overall structure of a perfume usually has very few materials that are just massively dosed. And the ones that are really massively dosed are usually the ones, those materials are pretty light, um, not very heavy. So you're gonna massively dose those and kind of create the structure, the backbone, the skeleton. And then you're gonna to start to add in nuances of all these other materials based on the theme that you're trying to achieve. And it's hard to explain it without actually like showing you guys. But to show you guys, I would have to make like 50, excuse me, like 50 trial batches to explain it all. And this would be like a five hour long video. <laughs> so I guess the takeaway for that is when somebody asks me, well, where do you start? Yes. You can start with a massive, you know, 60, 70 line formula written down and be like, okay, I think this looks good. I think this looks good. Yes, yes. Okay, I've got all the materials I want. I have the proportions that I think might work. And then you just go ahead and blend the whole entire thing from scratch, from top to bottom, boom, all in one. Chances are it's not going to smell good. <laughs> it's going to be ballpark of maybe what you thought but when you formulate an entire perfume on the very first try and you just map out all like 50 60 70 materials and you just go with it and just do the whole thing at once the only way you're going to be really successful in that is if you have used and used again every single material on that sheet so many times that you're very familiar with how it's dosed and the funny thing is, even though you can be an expert or a master perfumer, knowing how like, you know, something like triplol, which is a, you know, a, a grassy green leafy material, you, you'll know like, oh, if I keep this within one part per thousand in the formula, I'm usually safe. There's no right or wrong way to dose a material. And that's the crazy thing with perfumery because some people think it's so scientifically proven that like X material will always be dosed at this percentage to be a good, you know, effective dosing. And that's never the case. Something like vanillin, which everybody knows it smells like vanilla. It's very sweet, very tenacious, long lasting base note. You can dose something vanillin in a perfume up to like 3% in the, in the perfume concentrate, or you can, you know, dose it at like one part per thousand. And it all varies based on the overall composition of what you're trying to achieve. So if I had like a summer citrusy, crisp, neroli, you know, fragrance that was intended for summer, I'm not going to throw in like one to 2% of vanillin in it and expect it to smell great. It's going to completely take it out of the summer freshy territory into something different. But if you put in one to two parts per thousand, it might sweeten it up. So there's no right dosing for every material because the right dosing for the material is highly dependent on what you're trying to achieve in the perfume based on the style and the outcome that you want. So when somebody always asks me, they're like, you know, uh, let's see, what's a, what's a good one here? Kumarin, they're like, you know, Kumarin, what, what's the average dosing? There is no average dosing. I've seen Kumarin dosed at 5% in formulas. I've seen it dosed in traces. It's all dependent on the whole perfume structure as a whole how it interacts with every other material. And that's what makes perfumery so, not to say complicated, because perfumery is really not. It's, it just makes it hard because 
when you're reformulating, and trust me, when you're making fragrances, you will reformulate and reformulate again. Master perfumers sometimes will spend a year, a year and a half, two years on the same formula before they deem it as, okay, it's, it's finished now. It feels the way that I intended. You will find that you will always constantly have to, not to say relearn your materials, but you will always surprise yourself when you're trying to formulate for like a new perfume and you add in something, let's say like, you know, Furminich's Cassis base, you're, you know, you've used this material a hundred times, but every time you use it in a different scenario, the outcome is slightly different and it usually surprises you. You could be like, wow, I've put in like one part per thousand of Cassis base in this blend and I, I still can't smell it. What's going on? I could smell it before in the other batch or in the other fragrances that I've made it that were completely different, but I can't smell it in this. Why is that? It's because that one material, the dosing is very dependent on everything else in the perfume, in the perfume as a whole. So there is no true right way to dose a particular item. You have to look at the structure of the perfume, the whole formula as a whole, in order to understand the correct dosing of what it's doing to the whole composition. That was a pretty big rant. <laughs> I felt like I kind of kept going in circles. So to go back to the original question, when somebody says, well, where do you start on a perfume? I do have my moments where I will write out a whole, you know, 50, 60 line item, you know, formula and be like, okay, I think this looks right. This kind of looks accurate. And I'll just make up the whole thing in one shot and we'll just see what happens. Or sometimes I'll have a concept. Well, I'll just work in small batches. And to give you an example, there was a, a fragrance I was, I'm actually still working on, still retweaking. There's a fragrance that I'm working on that's supposed to be an aromatic, slightly gourmand, uh, very woody, very ambery, um, kind of intended for wintertime uh, for a man. And, but I wanted it to be somewhat gourmand, somewhat classy, but very aromatic, and I wanted it to be kind of dense. Um, so on, in this scenario, instead of just writing up a whole entire formula for the perfume and just kind of doing it all in one go and seeing what happens, I wanted to tackle it in stages. And what I did was I started with, I thought to myself, I was like, well, what's the theme? I, I told myself over and over, what's the theme? What's the end goal? What's the outcome I'm trying to achieve? And then I picked out a few materials that I kind of knew that I wanted to be the star players. And... The star players, I, I believe in this one, were, uh, what was it, cardamom, cardamom CO2 natural oil. There was a woody amber material, uh, which I forget what I, it might have been amber core, it might have been, it was a very light, easy to dose amber woody material. Uh, vanilla and something else, I forget what it was. Some sort of uh, something, I forget. But it, I started off with just four materials and I, I was just like, okay, let me just play with these four materials and just different ratios and just see what comes out and see, you know, see what I come up with and if, it, if it's within the realm I'm trying to go for. And when I blended these things, ironically, it kind of shaped this weird chai tea accord. Um, for those who might not understand English very well, I didn't say Tai Chi, which is a type of martial arts. I mean chai tea, the drink, the, the tea that you drink. And it, it was the, in, the weird interplay of the cardamom, the woody amber material, and the vanilla, and I forget what the fourth material was, the way that they interplayed at a certain ratio gave this vibe of a chai tea. And I thought that was perfect because to me, chai tea is a very fall, autumn kind of drink. Uh, and it's very gourmand. So it fit the theme that I was trying to achieve. So I knew that these four materials was a start of an accord. Um, so, but now of course I wanted to take this further. So once I found that the good ratio of these four materials, I was like, okay, I'm gonna build off of this. 
and I knew I wanted some aromatics, something that, that felt within the fall theme. So I was like, well, lavender is a very fall wintry kind of theme. So I started to dose in some lavender. Now we're at five materials and I got the interplay on that. I was like, okay, this is a good start of something just based on like five materials. And then I started adding in small amounts of like woods. I was like, well, what kind of wood do I want to put in? I wanted to do sandalwood. So I was like, well, I've got so many different sandalwood aroma chemicals. I've got the naturals. It's like, well, what do I start with? So I was like, well, let me try and play with uh, for Santal from Furmanich and we're going to do Dreamwood Base and see if we can add that in and get a nice creaminess. And that's where things started to click. I got creaminess from the sandalwood, the chai tea accord. So it gave the chai tea like a, cr a woody, but also a creaminess. So I was like, this is going in the direction that I intended and this is good. So then once you add things more and more, and you start to build a structure, or at least you're building an accord based on all these materials. And once I got to a point where I was kind of happy with just a blend of like maybe 10 materials, I was like, okay, I'm going to now take these 10 materials and dump it into a skeleton backbone. And when I mean skeleton backbone, it's like the typical, you know, I'm gonna have you know, 10% Hedion, 10% Izui Super, you know, maybe 15% of some sort of mus. And I dumped my, my, you know, my, basically my accord that I was kind of forming into this, what I consider like the bed, uh, the, the generic, you know, bed of Hedion, Izui Super, mus, and see how that interplayed. And then what I noticed is, if I used very little Izoe Super, very little Hedion, very little Mus, this accord that I was building was very bold. It was very in your face. It was like when you sprayed it, it was just like, holy crap, okay, that's loud. Almost too loud. And I know you're probably thinking, BK, there's no such thing as too loud. We all want fragrances that project like monsters. We all want fragrances that last eternity. No, we do not, trust me. You don't want to go into a room smelling like a, a perfume whore where somebody can smell you all the way from like a, you know 50 feet away. Nobody wants to be that person. Nobody wants to smell that person. It's annoying. It's cloying. So what I kept doing was I was like, well, at this ratio with my accords that I built into my perfume bed of, you know, Izoe Super Hedion and some mus. I want to now increase the Isoe Super and Hedion and see what happens. And then I noticed the more that I increased it, it kind of took this cloying sensation down a notch. It almost, not to say diluted my accords, but the best way to describe it would be it kind of diluted it. It kind of mellowed it out. It leveled out the playing field. So, and then I built it from there. And then once I got it into a ratio where I wanted it, I was like, okay, we're gonna need some top notes. You know, maybe I'll add in a little bit of, you know, a little touch of mint here, cause it's a, a wintry fall fragrance, you know, a little brisk mint might smell nice. Maybe a little, you know, blood orange or sweet orange to kind of top it off and things like that. And then you start to play with little nuances where it's like, okay, I've got things built into this nice kind of accord this perfume is it feels like it's complete but it's missing things and then you start to play around you can add traces of this and that maybe you know like zero a point zero zero one percent of an aldehyde to see if it gives it sparkle you can add in you know maybe one part per thousand of your favorite you know woody amber super material or whatever to see if it gives it lift you can try all these little nuances and be like well it's going to need some cis 3 hex and i want to green it up a bit we'll try two parts per thousand of that and just kind of play with little nuances and shape it and shift it uh, want some fruitiness let's try fruit sec from i think it's ferminit or iff or we can try other fruity materials to fruit it up a bit you know there's all these things but you build it up. But to build something up, you have to start from something. And that's obviously the idea and the concept, but you have to start with choice materials of, well, 
what are some star players that I want to work with? What are some of the key materials that I want to work with and see if I can create an accord with these key materials and then build it up from there? Yeah. I ramble a lot, apparently. <laughs> so I think that should wrap it up. Hopefully you guys got maybe some insight. I probably just confused you all some more, especially for the, the beginner perfumer that's probably watching these videos for the first time. They're probably like, what? This makes no sense. It's point me in the right direction. In perfumery, there really is no right direction. The one thing that, you'll, that I find funny is even master perfumers that have been in the industry for 20, 30 years, they're always in a constant state of learning as well. As new fragrance houses build new aroma chemicals, new materials, those master perfumers aren't going to know how to use them yet because they're brand new. They've never used them. They're, so then they spend the next year trying to figure out this material. What's a good dosing based on these different styles? And they have to relearn materials all the time. We are all in the same boat. We're always in a constant state of learning. If somebody ever comes off as boisterous and just like thinks they're Mr. Know-it-all, just laugh at them because you know what? They're still in a constant state of learning too. And whether if they don't want to admit it or not, that's up to them. So, yeah, I rambled. I'm going to just end this video now. So with that being said, hopefully I'll find time to do another a proper video uh, soon to come where I can maybe do some more formulation videos and kind of do something of that nature. But with that being said, until next time, see you later. Thank you.